Good afternoon. I'm Katie Cottingham, and welcome to this news briefing from the 251st National Meeting and Exposition of the American Chemical Society in San Diego. We're joined today by Dr. Brian Bellett from Western, Universe, sorry, Western Illinois University. He will be talking to us about his work on lipstick forensics. Dr. Bellett? Thank you. So I have a research project in my group which focuses on the extraction and analysis of different types, brands, and um, shades of lipstick. So what we do is we do a simple extraction procedure to get out the various dyes, and then we run three different types of chromatography to separate the dyes into a distinctive pattern. Um, a lot of people compare it to fingerprints, so the lipsticks can actually generate what I would call a fingerprint that identifies each one from each other. And then we use that data in an attempt to build a database. Obviously, there's literally millions of different types and shades of lipstick, so our major goal is to develop a method so that somebody wanted to test a lipstick of their own, they could add it to the database, and then it would continue growing forever and ever, if you will. Um, I typically have um, undergraduates work on the research project. It's one of the major goals. We have a forensic chemistry program at Western, and students typically like to go after a project that they can relate to and they can understand. This is really approachable for most students. So that's what we try to do. We try to focus on the undergraduates, get them some research, try to get them to talk at national meetings and things like that about their research. And uh, this is a project they seem to be able to do so far, so it's great. Okay, thanks so much. Um, so do we have any questions? Please state your name and affiliation before you ask your question. Kath? Hi, so it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. Can you say a little bit about the chemistry of lipsticks? What compounds are in lipsticks and how much do they vary by? So that's a great question. Um, it turns out a lot of the information about what's in the lipstick is proprietary to the companies. And so we've presented this poster a few times now, and we've had several companies like L'Oreal and like um, companies like that come up to us and say, what do you know about what's in it? And it turns out we don't know much about what's in it, and we don't need to know. Because the way we identify the sample, we get very distinctive bands for each brand of lipstick. And using some statistical analysis, we can prove that they're different from each other. So just using gas chromatography, which gives you a signal, but not doesn't tell you what the signal is, we can identify the different shades of lipsticks from each other. So um, we, we, one part of our extraction that does remove all the waxes and binders out of the, the sample. And so we're left pretty much with just the dye residue. And we analyze the dye residue. Has anyone ever been convicted as a result of sort of lipstick evidence? Has that actually ever formed part of a, um, a case? At this point, I don't know. I mean, one of the great parts about this, this opportunity to do this press conference is hopefully I'll be contacted via email or phone about um, applications of this similar type of thing. I do know the FBI has a current technique for doing the same thing. It's very different than ours. It involves a very expensive piece of equipment and a highly trained scientist to run. Our method, as I said, is run by bachelor scientists, so hopefully it's more amenable to the general public and, and um, smaller crime labs than having to go to the FBI. I'm sure other crime labs do um, analysis, but they don't really tell me how they do it yet. So, so I was going to ask, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you don't know sort of what other methods are used? Or um, how much, so, what, can you just compare your method then? What, what's so, best, what's good about your method? Oh, my, we're comparing my method to the other methods yeah. I know of. So I, do, I know of, of three different methods. The, the x-ray based technique obviously um, is non-destructive, meaning the sample can be recovered afterwards, which is a benefit of that technique. Um, the major drawback, as I said, was you need highly trained um, scientists to run the instrumentation. You also need uh, expensive instrumentation to run it. Um, the other technique is similar to our chromatography technique, but it's not a general approach. It's more of a, if you're given a sample, can you compare it to another sample and show that they're the same? Whereas mine is more of a, um, you can take any sample and lift it and then compare it to a database and see if it's different or the same. Um, the major drawback of my technique though is it's destructive. So once we're done with the sample, you can't recover it and put it into evidence. It's gone and it can't be used again. So if any testing needed to be done on the sample, it had to be done before our extracted procedure. So we've had a lot of questions about DNA analysis. Can you take DNA out of the lipstick sample before you run your sample? And if somebody would want to collaborate and talk to me, we can see if it's possible to do that. But I haven't done that at this point. And how, what's the sensitivity of your technique as well? How much lipstick do you need? Um, so we've, 
we, we haven't done a concentration yet, but if you can imagine um, a faint smear on a, a clear glass, if you can just barely see it through the light, we, we get detection off the, off the chart with that. So it's very good. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, other questions? Bela? Bela Buslik, Office of Public Affairs. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, the question uh, really is, uh, you're using chromatography as a, as a uh, are you using any kind of a pattern rec recognition program uh, to, to classify your samples? Uh, I mean, that's, that's a fairly commonly used, uh, used thing. And lipsticks, for example, uh, contain, uh, you know, fatty substances, uh, uh, minerals, uh, various kind of, uh, kind of things. Some will not extract at all. Uh, some volatile compounds on the other end uh, kind of disappear in the air, uh, air if, if you age the sample. How do you, uh, do you decide where uh, uh, the sample comes from other than taking samples of various kinds of lipsticks and, and comparing them? Right, so our, our major goal in the project is, is method development. So right. we, we can't obviously address things that have insoluble binders and things like that. We can't deal with um, um, processes where it's non-volatile. Um, we, we did compare TLC to HPLC to GC, so thin layer chromatography to high-performance liquid chromatography to grass chromatography. And gas chromatography was the, the best technique out of the three according to our findings, which involves a volatile substrate, as you know. Um, it turns out that most dyes, although they're really high boiling, they still come off on the GC detection at less than 200 degrees C using our method. So it's not too difficult for us to see that. Um, we have yet to encounter a sample that didn't give us at least 20 signals. And, and, and every sample so far has had at least two distinctive symbols, signals that were significantly different than every other sample. Um, we have tried some pattern matching software. We haven't found a good piece of software, and we, we can't currently afford to buy a nice piece of software to do it for us. But it's in the, it's in the works. You know, when you're doing your GC uh, comparisons, uh, are you uh, it, it essentially doing... Uh, dual runs of polar, non-polar uh, polar, uh, stuff, because one GC trace is not going to identify all Right, so problems. we're pretty confident in our statistics. So we run three trials per day on three different days, and the samples are randomized based on the um, uh, 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 random number generator. So we have up to nine data points per sample, and we run them in triplicate. So it ends up being 27 data points per sample that we use for each sample. Um, and then we use two different columns. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Other questions in the back? Christine, Christine. Sa, Office of Public Affairs. Um, I was just curious to know whether your technique could be applied to other substances at crime scenes or in other situations outside of crime scenes. Yeah, so the student I have working on it, she's actually only a, a junior right now, and she's been thinking about the future. And, you know, we, we've developed our method. We're happy with it. We're going to continue improving it, but she's looking towards what else could I do? And that's what we're talking about now. So we haven't really decided anything. We can, the, the world's open, you know. I'm, I'm a very open-ended researcher, so I don't really dictate what my students are going to do. They bring me an idea, and then I work with them to make sure that it's a solid, fundamental uh, topic. So it's really more of a discovery phase on their part. I didn't propose this project. It was actually brought to me by the student. So she said, I want to do this, and I said, sure, let's take a look. And we started out with just TLC, and we found out that it was a decent technique, but you couldn't get quite the resolution you needed, and so we evolved into, you know, better techniques. Okay, other questions? Uh, I have a question. So what surfaces have you uh, worked with for the lipstick smears, and, and are you looking at other additional surfaces? Yeah, so currently we've done um, paper. So we just, just to swab it on paper to keep the, the variables down. Mm -hmm. And that's what we got all of our stats off of. And we've done um, um, t-shirts. Mm. We've done not so nice t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, we're moving towards using things like glass, using a cotton swab to extract it off of the glass and then extracting off the cotton swab to see what we can get. Okay. But we haven't done that yet. Mm -hmm. OK, other questions? Um, yeah, so uh, I had another question, too. Um, so what, what was the, the biggest challenge that you had? Uh, what was the most difficult thing that you guys had to work out? 
it's probably not the best answer, but funding was the biggest problem, yeah. right? So if a student brings you a, pro a, a problem or a project they want to work on, you have to find some funding for it. And there's no funding cycle really in the world that gives you money within a year. And I'm talking with undergraduate students here, so mm -hmm. it's not like you can just get money right away. Mm -hmm. So that was difficult, is to get the money to fund the project at first. Um, after that was training. You know, me and, and her learning how to do the extractions mm -hmm. and learning the procedure you needed to do the extractions was difficult. We found some literature online which did similar things, mm -hmm. but um, their data was highly irreducible. As, as alluded to earlier, you have to collect a lot of data to get good stats. Mm -hmm. And we had to talk to a statistician to find out the right way to collect the data. Um, you know, in the chemistry I normally do, you, if you run a thing in triplicate, so you get three data points, that's good enough. Um, according to the statistician, you needed three data points, but you also needed to collect three data points on three different days mm -hmm. to get decent stats. So there's analysis of variance and then between day variance that we mm -hmm. had to get. And so that's something we didn't really think about beforehand, but now we know and we yeah. take that going forward. Okay. Other questions? If not, thank you so much for joining us for this press conference. Um, this, ar this archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly slash ACS Live San Diego. Please join us for our next press conference today at 3 o'clock on how research can help address the global wa water crisis. Thank you.